For me and many others, the Wii Shop channel was the first digital download service on a console that we ever used. Through the virtual console, some of the best games from the NES all the way up to Neo Geo made their way through the internet to your Wii system memory. And later, Nintendo and other developers, both big and small, released a steady stream of original titles branded as WiiWare. At the time, digital distribution was an exciting novelty, but now the biggest caveat of the digital model looms over the Wii Shop channel, which is set to go offline forever in 2019. That may seem like some time from now, but you actually won't be able to buy Wii Shop points for purchasing games starting March 26th, 2018, which as of the time of this video is really, really soon. Of course, any of these games can be installed to a Wii system via homebrew, which is admittedly a necessary evil for long-term preservation. But for those who have no interest in installing the homebrew channel or feel compelled to purchase the games legitimately, time is running out. Whether it's classic games that have become too expensive in the vintage gaming market or some indie hidden gems, we've joined forces with a few other YouTube channels to put together a list of reasons to give the Wii Shop channel one last look before it's too late. The Nintendo Wii Shop went online in North America with the console launch on November 19th, 2006. Along with it, a number of virtual console games, seven NES, two Super NES, two Sega Genesis, and one for the N64 made for a pretty decent launch. The following years were pretty strong, although the number of simultaneous releases would gradually decrease. The timing of this launch coincided with a personal shift in my own life. I was busy focusing on my career and had lost a lot of interest in games. Thus, I decided to go all digital, selling a lot of my old vintage video games and repurchasing the games I really cared about on the virtual console. I believed in what they were doing, and needless to say, I ended up with a lot of virtual console games. Each download included a custom tailored emulator to ensure the closest possible recreation of the original experience. These games didn't include any of the enhancements that might have been included in competing consoles at the time, but a big allure was how accurately they ran. Most virtual console titles can output their original 240p resolution when the Wii is set for interlaced mode. To this day, the benefit of this original resolution is the most compelling reason to still consider playing these games on a real Wii, especially for CRT fans. It undoubtedly makes these emulations feel that much more authentic. But a word of warning. You completely lose the ability to use 240p if you transfer your Wii games to a Wii U, even with analog cables. If at all possible, we recommend keeping your Wii downloads on an original Wii console. Among the seven NES games that were there at launch, you had a couple of heavy hitters. The original Legend of Zelda and Donkey Kong were probably the top priorities for most people, while soccer and pinball were firmly at the bottom of the barrel. Over the next six years, there would be 94 NES games released, with two of those games, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Yoshi's Cookie, being delisted and removed from sale in the intervening years. Much has been made about the subpar video quality of NES Virtual Console games, which is strangely dark compared to an original console. This is supposedly an anti-epilepsy measure, which affects all Virtual Console games to some extent, but it's especially egregious with NES. Of course, the original system was only capable of outputting RF and composite video natively, so the Wii VC does at least have some advantage when using component cables. The NES Virtual Console saw some really interesting releases during its time, with some weird omissions, the most sorely missed being the original Contra. What the heck is up with that? However, the most popular titles have popped up in other places since, including Nintendo's own NES Classic Edition. My absolute top choice for a must-have NES Virtual Console game is Euphoria The Saga, an action platformer from Sunsoft that was never released in North America. The US branch of Sunsoft had moved on to the SNES and Genesis by 1992, so it was a pleasant surprise to see it get a proper release on the VC. There's a lot of elements that make Euphoria feel a bit like a Metroid-style game. You meet new characters that you can become, allowing you to access new areas and pick up power-ups. 
It's a lot like Sunsoft's own Blaster Master, which, let's be honest, is one of the very best that the NES has to offer, and is on the VC as well, so get that if you haven't somehow played it yet. Sunsoft's pedigree of awesome NES soundtracks is immaculate, and it comes as no surprise that Euphoria fits in right with those other games. It's worth buying for that aspect alone. The NES is quite possibly my favorite console of all time, but whether it was because of the dark graphics or a lack of games I didn't already own as cartridges, I never bought too many NES games on the Wii. But I do have to recommend yet another Famicom import, Biomiracle Bakuta Upa. Yes, that Konami baby platformer. Such a dumb thing you can't help but want to play it, right? I know I did, and it's actually quite good. Biomiracle was originally a Famicom Disk System game released in 1988, and a slightly revised version was released as a cartridge nearly five years later, which is considered to be a bit rare and can be pretty expensive. The Virtual Console release is based on the original version, which uses the extra Famicom Disk System sound channel, but also lacks the option for an easy difficulty mode that the cartridge version has. And it's no game for babies. It offers a fair bit of challenge, but it also has infinite continues, so it's nothing that a seasoned NES player would find to be cruel and unusual. Upa's basic attack is to hit enemies with his rattle, which causes them to float away like balloons for some reason. They can then be used as moving platforms or for knocking into other enemies. If you're a fan of NES platformers, you owe it to yourself to not miss one of Konami's weirdest games of the era. Duke here, and if you're an NES adventure game fan like me, then there's one title on Virtual Console you need to play before it's too late, Princess Tomato and the Salad Kingdom. This is an NES game that plays a lot like Snatcher on the Sega CD, only instead of Snatcher's gritty cyberpunk story, in Princess Tomato you play as Sir Cucumber, off to rescue the titular Princess Tomato from the evil Minister Pumpkin. It's a bit weird, it's really colorful, the music's great, and the writing is phenomenal. Princess Tomato might be one of the funniest games on the NES. If you're just starting to dip your toe into the digital comic book style of adventure games, these are adventure games that don't use a cursor but instead kind of tell you where everything is and what you can interact with, Princess Tomato is an excellent game to add to your backlog for $5. It sure as heck beats waiting around for an $80 to $100 eBay listing for the original cart, or maybe a couple hundred if you want it in the box. It's a great game, and if you can get it cheap, you really should. It's a shame that it's going to be disappearing from the Virtual Console service soon and never really got a port anywhere else. Playing it on the Wii is the only way to do so unless you have the NES cartridge. Which, maybe that'll be a good addition one day. But for now, if you want a good laugh and a great adventure, and a really adorable game to share with your family, Princess Tomato in the Salad Kingdom is one you don't want to miss. With only 63 titles available, the Super Nintendo Virtual Console on Wii barely scratches the surface of the system's greatness. Super FX games like Yoshi's Island are notably missing, and regrettably a fair number of titles were delisted from the service between 2012 and 2014, including all versions of Street Fighter 2. When using component cables, video quality is not as sharp as a one-chip SNES console and appears a bit darker than original hardware with RGB, but it's nowhere near as severe as the NES situation. All the same, you can find a strong selection of heavy hitter RPGs, lesser known titles, and games that these days you'd have to spend well over $200 to get a physical cartridge of. Wild Guns is a perfect example, truly one of the best action games for the system, one that I had previously not heard of and is, as it turns out, a heck of a better deal at $8 than $200. We've recently talked at length about our love of the PS4 version, which is, for all intents and purposes, a total upgrade and replacement for the original game, but the Wii Virtual Console is an excellent way to check out the original version at its native 240p resolution.
In the 8 and 16-bit era, Konami was at the absolute top of their game. With so many good releases, it's easy for a handful of them to get forgotten. One such game is Axelay, a hybrid vertical and horizontal mashup that is quite possibly the best shooter on the SNES. Odd levels are overhead segments, where the field of view curves over the horizon, making for a pretty mind-bending effect. The even levels are side-scrolling, which, let's be honest, aren't nearly as cool, but they do offer a nice reprieve from the intense visual stimulation. Every time I bring this game out, Try can't help but comment on how impressive it looks. Sadly, there was never any follow-up nor even a port to any other console. It's fairly expensive for a cart these days, so this is a rock-solid choice. Releasing import games on Virtual Console is one of the best decisions Nintendo made with the Wii. There's a lot of great games that never saw the light of day in the West, and this service suddenly opened them up to a whole new audience. Case in point, Doremi Fantasy Mylon's Doki Doki Adventure. I'm a huge fan of the game and was thrilled that it finally made its way west on Virtual Console. After all, as a 1996 release in Japan, it's no surprise that Hudson Soft skipped out on it originally. Canonically, it's a sequel to 1988's Mylon's Secret Castle on the NES, but it really couldn't be more different. Doremi Fantasy is a platform game at its heart, with seven unique worlds to explore accessible via a Mario-like world map. Mylon himself controls beautifully with responsive movement and a bubble mechanic to trap enemies while bumping them off the screen. What I love about the game besides its excellent level design is the presentation. The pixel art is sublime, the color palette beautiful, and the soundtrack extremely atmospheric. It takes full advantage of the Super NES hardware to deliver one of the best looking platformers on the system. Anyone that loves Mario style platform games owes it to themselves to give it a shot. Despite Sega's presence on the Virtual Console since the beginning, it was sort of unexpected to see Master System games appear on the Wii Shop. There's just something about seeing games like Alex Kid in America World and Fantasy Star that made me feel like the Virtual Console was finally fully realized. The Master System games look great, and in some cases slightly brighter than what I tend to get out of my own launch era console, but this is a problem that I've run into before. I was pleasantly surprised to find that an FM sound option is selectable if the original game supported it. Although there weren't a ton of Master System games released on the service, only 16 total, a good amount of the console's best games were featured. Only our type ended up being delisted, which is too bad because this was my preferred version of the game as a kid. For a US Master System fan, the name Secret Command might not ring a bell, but once you see it in action, it's easy to connect the dots. This was the European version of the amazing Rambo First Blood Part 2, an overhead running gun that's very reminiscent of Capcom's Commando. Armed with a machine gun and a bow with explosive arrows, you can see why they decided to go with a Rambo license. It matches right down to the red headband. This was one of my favorite games on the system as a kid, and a lot of that had to do with a two-player simultaneous action. Any Master System fan knew that it was all about the small victories against the NES, and this was an exclusive worth celebrating. The Master System was for a long time a bit of an enigma to me. I didn't know anyone who had one growing up, but even I knew that if there was one game I had to play for the system, that would be Fantasy Star. Now, I'm a big fan of the Dragon Quest and Final Fantasy series, but if you were to compare their first entries to Fantasy Star, well, it's hard to deny that Fantasy Star looks better and arguably has a bigger and grander vision. 
I'm not sure if it's necessarily better, but it certainly feels like a more impressive game compared to its contemporaries. The first person dungeons are quite enjoyable early on if you like drawing your own maps, although the multi-level dungeons later in the game become far too convoluted. Despite some frustrations and other stumbling blocks, I think anyone who still has a soft spot for late 80s RPGs has to give Fancy Star a try. So Sonic 2 on the Master System, that's one that I think is an absolute must buy for the Wii Virtual Console. And here's why, because when most people think of the 8-bit Sonic the Hedgehog games, they think of the Game Gear games, and when you hear the phrase Sonic 2, it's like, oh, it's like the Genesis game, right? Well, actually, no, this one is completely different. And the Master System version, the way that they had recreated the stages from the Game Gear before I added it on the TV, it works so, so well. And the sense of speed is there, the level design is great, the graphics are great, the music is absolutely excellent, and you even got the cool little bonus stage features such as riding around in a minecart, going hand gliding, which the controls take a little bit to get used to, but once they're there, they're mm, magnifique. Like just all these different aspects, like you never really knew what came next, and it was really ahead of its time. And since we were denied it in the United States back in the day on a physical cart, getting this on the virtual console, it's, that's a no-brainer. I, I know I have it on my virtual console, and it's totally worth it. And I think it's one in the franchise that, that's often overlooked in conversation. So I think Sonic 2 and the Master System, it's, it's absolutely worth it. Go buy it. Sonic says, go buy it. Yeah. Growing up as a Nintendo kid, I had a fairly superficial knowledge of the Genesis library. When the Wii released, I still hadn't yet bought a real Genesis, so I was easily more excited about Sega's 16-bit back catalog than I was for any other virtual console system. Aside from the obvious stuff like Sonic, I really had no idea what I might discover. And luckily, there was plenty to check out. At 73 titles available with only 2 d listed, Genesis is the second most prolific Wii Virtual Console system in North America after the NES. Unfortunately, there are some glaring omissions. No Konami games whatsoever, which is a huge disappointment at the time because I still hadn't had a chance to play Contra Hardcore, Castlevania Bloodlines, or Rocket Knight Adventures, all of which I've since been able to experience on original hardware and considered to be right at the top of the best games for the Genesis. All the same, Sega did a great job of putting their most essential games up for sale. While the Wii's component output is a bit softer than the Genesis's RGB output, one interesting advantage of the virtual console versions is that the colored overscanned borders and flickering dots that can appear on a real Genesis are removed. Few virtual console titles made as much of an impression on me as Wonder Boy and Monster World. A game that I had absolutely never heard of, I completely glossed over its initial listing on the service, but it's a perfect example of how the Virtual Console could bring great surprises. Known in Japan as Wonder Boy 5 Monster World 3, it takes place in an interconnected Metroid-style world, with new areas becoming available to you as you collect items and adventure abilities. Gold dropped by enemies essentially serves as experience points for buying new weapons, shields, armor, and boots. It may not look like anything too crazy or amazing, but it's just so gosh darn pleasant that it's easily become one of my favorite Genesis games. Its simple style and vibrant colors has made Wonder Boy and Monster World the longest running in joke on our channel, appearing in some form in every single RGB Masterclass episode. The final Genesis release for the Wii is also quite significant. The Virtual Console version of Monster World 4 was its first release outside Japan and comes with a newly created official English translation. We recommend the Virtual Console version for the flexibility offered by the 240p analog output if you have the means to use it, 
but the same translated version was shortly after released for PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. Either way, we consider Monster World 4 an absolute must play. The Wonder Boy part of the title was removed to make way for new protagonist Asha, whose bond with a blue creature called a Pepelugu makes for some of the most engaging pet mechanics in any game. While the world structure is less open-ended than previous Monster World games, the Pepelugu's evolution means that abilities come and go over the course of the game, making each new chapter play a bit differently from the last. It's truly a special and charming game that should not be missed. The Genesis Virtual Console had a truly spectacular lineup, with most all of Sega's own hits represented. However, the selection does include a couple of truly great import titles that deserve special attention. Pulse Man from Game Freak, you know, of Pokemon fame, was only released via the Sega channel in North America, making the Japanese cartridge highly sought after. But its history isn't the only reason to play Pulse Man. It's a very good looking game, with large sprites and bright colors, and a pretty kickin' soundtrack to boot. Despite its occasionally quirky controls and hit detection, Pulse Man might have been a hit if it had been given a more proper release by Sega of America. I also want to take a quick moment to recommend the Genesis version of Ghouls and Ghosts. This Capcom arcade port was programmed by Yuji Naka in-house for Sega. I assume that this was a way to get around Nintendo's tyrannical publishing policies at the time. I got it along with my console on Christmas of 1989, and it's one of my absolute favorite games on the system. Sure, it's not exactly arcade perfect, but it was pretty surreal playing something that was so close to an arcade game at home. It's my preferred version of Ghouls and Ghosts. I've beaten it more than just about any other game in my lifetime. fifth or sixth time I've tried making this video for Cory and Try, and they keep rejecting it because I want to recommend Green Dog as the Genesis game you should get, but they say Green Dog isn't on the virtual console. I don't know why it isn't, but the last time I made this video for them, Try got really, really mad, started yelling at me, really mean things, and then he hit me. He hit me really hard. So, uh, I won't recommend Green Dog, but maybe Musha. It's, it's a really good overhead shooter. It's not Green Dog, but it's still really fun. It's, it's a lot cheaper on the virtual console. Please don't hit me, try. <laughs> Truly one of the best parts of the Virtual Console selection was exploring the perceived less popular systems libraries. No longer shackled by the console wars of my youth, I could finally play the TurboGrafx-16 and a good bit of its scintillating game lineup. 63 TG games were released on the VC in total, although 5 have been delisted over the years. Almost all the big ones are here, Blazing Lasers, Bonk, and more. The highest profile omission is probably Legendary Axe. You might notice that these games look a bit softer than other games on the VC. For some reason, Hudson decided to make their virtual console releases display at 480i and 480p instead of 240p, which results in the games having a bit of an overall blur to them. This is really an unfortunate situation and ends up being a real blemish on the visuals. Thankfully, this was rectified in 2008, but not before it affected a good amount of TurboGrafx CD games that started appearing in early 2007. The native 240p visuals are spot on perfect, with no noticeable darkening of the image to my eye. 
Shooters were a dime a dozen in 1992. It was nearly impossible to keep up with all of them. Between the TG-16 and the Genesis, it seemed like something like 70% of the games on the shelves were shooters. Gate of Thunder was the premier shooter for the Turbo CD, and was even included in the box with the Turbo Duo when it first released. It's not much of a reach to say that Gate of Thunder may just be the best shooter on the console. Heck, maybe even the best on the entire virtual console. It's fast-paced, isn't overly difficult, looks great with all its layers of parallax scrolling, and has a beautiful butt rock soundtrack. But hey, you don't have to believe me if you don't want to. Check out Bithead 1000's review and you realize that I'm telling the truth. It was like the two things your parents didn't want you to do! They didn't want you playing video games, and they didn't want you listening to this hard rockin' music. It was like... It, it might as well came with a sack of pot, too, in the mail. Now, JJ and Jeff is one of those weird games that I have no idea how it ever left Japan. But man, do I love Hudson Soft for it. The Japanese version is based on an old comedy show in its native country, and it's definitely a bit of a trip. Gate of Thunder, JJ and Jeff, how's that for Whiplash? You choose one character between this big-headed duo, who have been tasked to locate a rich man who has been kidnapped. They run left to right, picking up food that restores their vitality, and kick everything in their path while being bombarded by animals and poop. It's very reminiscent of the original Wonder Boy or Adventure Island, except for the poop part. disagree that the holy grail of the turbo graphics or more accurately the japanese pc engine cd system is castlevania rondo of blood this is the true and very superior version of richter belmont's tale that was rather watered down on the snes with the still worth checking out castlevania dracula x it is essential playing for any castlevania fan especially considering that the iconic symphony of the night is a direct sequel to it not only is the original version a Japanese exclusive for a system that a lot of people don't have, it is also extremely expensive, making this one of the best bang for your buck virtual console games, period. One interesting twist is that your character of choice essentially determines the game's difficulty. Maria, a child at the time of Rondo, is a ton of fun to play as, but also makes the game significantly easier compared to Richter's traditional whipping action. Many, maybe most diehard Castlevania fans consider Rondo of Blood to be the pinnacle of the series' original level-based action platforming gameplay. I myself feel a little more attached to 1, 3, and 4, but Rondo is absolutely a masterpiece that cannot be missed. Ah! Ah! <laughs> Hey, this is Derek from Stop Skeletons From Fighting, and I never pass up the opportunity to spread the good word of Splatterhouse, the 1988 Namco arcade classic. Unfortunately, its once obscure status meant that for years, the only available version was the 1990 TurboGrafx-16 port, a compromised but still serviceable way to experience this horror classic, available on the virtual console. With a name like Splatterhouse, there ain't no time for subtlety. From frame one, it's a gloriously trashy, bloody good time, chock full of grisly attacks and great monster design. It's a challenging game, but very simple. At first glance, this looks like a Final Fight-style brawler, but it's more an extremely stripped-down platformer. Splatterhouse unabashedly prioritizes style over substance, which does somewhat limit its appeal. However, the ultra-violence just gets you in the door. What makes this game truly special is, once it seems certain that it's all violence, viscera, and good times, Splatterhouse takes a sudden, dark, and tragic left-hand turn on a late-game boss. The game wraps up a few levels later, twisting the knife further with an incredibly sad ending. 
in its time, it was incredibly rare to see this kind of narrative in consoles and arcades. If the ending kicks you in the chest like it still does for me, or if the monster design and hyper-violence was enough to tide you over, I also highly recommend the arguably better Sega Genesis sequel, also available on Virtual Console. With only 21 titles available, only two of which are from third-party publishers, the Nintendo 64 is one of the least prolific virtual console categories. Perhaps it's unsurprising that Microsoft wouldn't have released any of Rare's N64 classics, but people often forget that companies like Konami, Ubisoft, and many others released a strong selection of N64 games too, and they're sorely missed here. While a significant chunk of Nintendo's own key titles are represented, there are also some unfortunate omissions like Pilot Wing 64. And more games really would have been great because the N64 Virtual Console is arguably the most useful. With the state of N64 emulation on PC still being rather disappointing as far as we know, the emulation on offer here is stable and fairly accurate. Although certain effects may not translate correctly, geometry seems might be more visible, and 2D art can at times look a bit mangled. But the key upgrade here is that the render resolution is bumped up from the system's typical 240p to 480p. It's hard to deny that visually it's an improvement in many ways. There's just so much potential here and we really hope that Nintendo steps up and gives us some up res N64 games for the Switch sometime in the future. The N64 Virtual Console library on the Wii isn't particularly surprising. The quality of Nintendo's own games is pretty much what you'd expect. Ogre Battle 64 is probably the most unusual release, although it's also available on Wii U Virtual Console, which isn't going anywhere yet. In fact, because 240p isn't a thing when it comes to N64 Virtual Console anyway, and the visual makeup is pretty similar between Wii and Wii U, the more pressing question may be, which N64 games are not available on Wii U, set to disappear with the Wii Shop channel? It seems that there are three. Cruisin' USA, ever a pick-up-and-play favorite of mine. Pokemon Puzzle League, an excellent alternative to Tetris Attack. Keep on trying! And probably most notably, the original Super Smash Bros. was released for the Wii Shop channel, but is curiously missing from the Wii U eShop. But whether you play it on Wii or Wii U, there is one undisputed king that defines the N64 Virtual Console experience. Top. Try is absolutely right. Sin and Punishment from Treasure is THE game you need to get on the N64 if you're investing in the Virtual Console. It's just too good not to get it. At a glance, this might seem like a fairly typical rail shooter, but once you start playing, it's obvious that there's so much more here. By making full use of the N64 controller, you can strafe, melee, and double jump. Unfortunately, translating these controls to the classic controller isn't quite as smooth as you'd hope. With some practice though, you should be able to adjust accordingly. SNP is fairly challenging and gets pretty intense at times. The bizarre story is just fun to watch. True to the original release, it is fully voiced in English with Japanese subtitles. So buy this game, finish it, and then hunt down its sequel, Sin and Punishment Star Successor, because it's probably one of the best games on the Wii, if not the best. So, a virtual console game that people should pick up before the service is long gone. That's an easy one for me. You all should check out Bomberman Hero on the N64. You all probably know what Bomberman is, of course you do. But, did you know that he had a full-on 3D platformer? 
and it's not half bad. It has the Bomberman mechanics of taking bombs and chucking them at enemies. It has a surprisingly really good soundtrack, and while it doesn't do anything overly awesome, it doesn't do anything overly wrong either. It is a perfectly average platformer, and that's not really a bad thing. If you're looking for another quality 3D platformer to play on the N64 or on the Wii's Virtual Console for only 1,000 Wii points, check no further, Bomberman Hero. By 2009, when game releases had slowed to a trickle, it was pretty shocking to see some new virtual console systems pop up. First, Commodore 64 games made an appearance, and then, the real Megaton, arcade games. Every one of the C64 games were delisted back in 2013, but all 21 arcade games are still available to purchase. Among these are a number of games from Namco, Tecmo, Sega, and Capcom that provide an interesting contrast to their home console versions that are already also on the surface. Mission 1 A staple of many a bowling alley when I was a kid, Shinobi may just be the most iconic game on Sega's System 16 arcade hardware, which served as the basis for the Sega Genesis hardware. This is a methodical side-scroller, where you, as the ninja Joe Musashi, are tasked with rescuing children who are taken hostage by the evil Zed organization. Armed with the classic shurikens and some ninja magic, Shinobi starts off pretty manageable, but the difficulty quickly ramps up. You can't quarter spam your way through this one. Welcome to the Vanity Zone. Get ready. My second choice is pretty obvious if you've been watching the show for a long time. Space Harrier is on the Virtual Console Arcade. And if you thought I wasn't going to recommend it, come on. Built on super scalar technology, Yu Suzuki Space Harrier is the game that made me fall in love with games. This version runs immaculately and even includes a fun arcade setting in the option menu that allows you to use the accelerometer and the nunchuck to mimic the arcade flight stick. It's nowhere near perfect, but I got a kick out of it. <laughs> Now, I have to admit, I didn't frequent arcades too much as a kid, and while there are certainly a few arcade games that I have a soft spot for, I've tended to have more interest in their home conversions. Okay, for real, this is the last time I'm going to bring up Wonder Boy in this video. Needless to say, one of my favorite parts of the Virtual Console is how it was able to provide me with something I didn't even know I wanted a pretty near-complete Wonder Boy experience. The arcade version of Wonder Boy in Monsterland is the first of the Monster World offshoots. As a linear arcade game, it's quite a bit different from what I'd come to know and love in the sequels, but it still has much of the same style, charm, equipment upgrades, and of course enemies that explode into coins. The arcade version starts off Wonder Boy in nothing but his... well... That sure looks like he's in his underwear, I guess. You'll have to manage your money and make wise choices to power up Wonder Boy as you progress through Monster Land. The Master System version is also available on Virtual Console, which, despite Wonder Boy appearing better equipped from the start, is quite similar to the arcade original, so just play whichever you prefer the look of. So the uh, Wii Virtual Console Shop is going to be closing here pretty soon, which means that this is your last chance to get one of the 21 arcade titles released for the platform. Looking at the list, I you know I would want to have like half of those games, but if I had to pick just one, I, I would definitely have to go with one of my all-time favorite arcade games, Golden Axe. I can still remember the first time I ever played Golden Axe. It must have been right about the time it came out, and it was in a round table pizza 
which is pretty fitting considering the, the fantasy theme they both had. You know, the game, of course, went on to become one of my favorite Genesis games, one of the few games that I had back then. But uh, there's really no topping the arcade original. In fact, it's one of the only arcade PCBs that I actually own. Golden Axe wasn't the first beat-em-up, but it feels like every beat-em-up that came out before it had sort of the same theme, you know, this dirty inner city vibe. And Sega really did something different with Golden Axe, having it take place, you know, in, in this fantasy, almost medieval style setting. You know, and you had the three different characters that were all very different. They all had different weapons, they had magic, and it was just an awesome, awesome game. And, you know, it's a little bit shorter than the home version. They, they added some extra levels to the Genesis, which is nice. But, you know, I feel like most people really associate Golden Axe with the Genesis and have probably never tried the arcade original. And if you never have, like, now's the time, you know, pick it up on the, on the Wii Virtual Console and check out the original arcade version of Golden Axe. Let's face it, Neo Geo Games at Home was something that very few Wii owners likely had experienced before the Virtual Console. Luckily, the Neo Geo Virtual Console on the Wii is no slouch, offering 54 games over the course of its service. Of course, there have also been a number of SNK compilations over the years, even as retail releases for the Wii and some on PS2 are presented in 240p. However, many others are 480i resolution or higher, and as such, we believe that the Wii Virtual Console remains the only official method for playing many of these games in the intended 240p resolution, other than original hardware. For action game fans, Metal Slug is probably the Neo Geo's most famous series. But for me, I found myself more drawn to another. Shock Troopers is an overhead running gun and is simply one of the best, if not the best of its kind. Featuring a colorful lineup of eight playable characters brought to life by superb sprite work with their own strengths, weaknesses, and special weapons, and three distinct paths that lead up to the final battle, you can't help but take one look and think, now this is a game I want to play. You can choose between Lonely Wolf, excuse me, Lonely Wolf, or Team Battle. Lonely Wolf gives you three lives for a single character, while Team Battle lets you choose three characters that you can switch between freely, all of who have their own health bars, so you can protect weakened characters when needed and prioritize who needs to recover. With the continues available, a friend and I only had to start the whole game over once before we could finish it. Second Squad. Shock Troopers Second Squad gets a bit of a bad rap, and it's easy to see why. The character count is halved from 8 to 4, and the sprite art has been replaced with computer generated pre renders, which probably seemed more cutting edge at the time, but absolutely feels like an artistic step back. Now, I have a big soft spot for 90s pre rendered graphics, and the game still looks quite smooth, so I'm rather okay with it despite acknowledging that it probably was the wrong choice. You also lose the team battle option, meaning that you can only choose one character per continue. So on the surface, it seems like Shock Troopers 2 is just a bafflingly lacking sequel, but I have to be honest, part of me feels like it might be the slightly better game, at least in some regards. The cast may be radically reduced, but as a result, the characters are more distinguishable and their gameplay differences are more noticeably pronounced. I also feel like the level design might be just a bit more interesting. And if nothing else, it does feature one major addition to the gameplay, Metal Slug-esque tanks. My friend that I co-op Shock Troopers with suggested that we play the second game first because of its reputation, and we had a blast! Take this game on its own merits, and I think you'll find that it's far better than its legacy as an inferior sequel would suggest. <laughs>
price tag of the Neo Geo and its games assured they would always be well out of my reach. With the Virtual Console, I was finally able to play these games at home in their native resolution. Ironclad was a bit of a pleasant surprise when it popped up on the Virtual Console. This horizontally scrolling shooter was originally on the Neo Geo CD in 96, and a Japan exclusive to boot. It was nearly finished for a release on cartridge, but it was ultimately discarded in favor of the CD version. That almost complete cartridge was the basis for the VC version. Featuring a pre-rendered graphical style typical of the late 90s, Ironclad is a side-scroller, but the way it places the viewing angle a bit higher almost makes it seem like a side-scrolling vertical shooter. I think that makes sense. Gameplay is pretty standard for a shooter, although it does include a number of flourishes to hook ya. The satellite pod can be charged allowing for different attacks such as drills and flamethrowers. And you have a life meter, which is always a welcome addition in these types of games. The end of each level presents you with branching paths that gives it a surprising amount of replayability. In a clever case of reverse engineering, hackers were able to extract the ROM from the downloadable WAD file, which is the file format for all VC games, and take that ROM and put it on cartridge. What a cool example of game preservation, right? Hey, I'm Aaron from my channel Aaron Plays, and I think people should check out Blue's Journey. When you think of Neo Geo games, chances are you think of a lot of fighting games. Well, the super colorful weird game is actually a side-scrolling platformer that is totally unlike any other Neo Geo game you've played. You play as the main character, Blue, and you spend most of the game running around a forest that looks straight out of Candyland. And you can stun your enemies and then throw them as weapons, and you can even shrink yourself down to access secret areas. It's pretty cool. And you can even add a player too, and they would play as Princess Fa. The wacky enemies and the cutesy power-ups and the fact it was only released on Neo Geo makes for a really unique and cool platforming experience. I totally recommend downloading it from the Virtual Console while you still can. Okay, peoples, here is the moment you have all been waiting for! The long-awaited premiere! In the midst of the virtual console stagnation, Nintendo finally unveiled WiiWare, a service that would feature smaller games from large and small developers alike. Sony and Microsoft had already seen a fair share of downloadable games on their systems, but Nintendo heavily focused on original games. Many of the big ones were never released anywhere else. You absolutely must download the Rebirth trilogy from Konami. Gradius Rebirth, Contra Rebirth, and Castlevania The Adventure Rebirth. The Rebirth name sorta implies that these are remakes of previous games, but they're actually a weird conglomeration of elements from previous games brought together to make something brand new. Mixing retro sprites with some new style effects, it's apparent at times that these were made on the cheaper side, but regardless, it works incredibly well, with each game offering lots of stuff to make longtime fans super happy. Contra Rebirth is totally insane, and it feels like an homage to specifically Contra 3 with a lot of ridiculousness piled on top. I'm talking shooting through an exploding space station where you eventually end up riding the debris into the Earth's atmosphere while fighting a giant worm. And that's just the first level. If you're going to get one Rebirth game, make it this one. And it looks great in 480p too. Gradius Rebirth pulls bosses and power-ups from previous games liberally, giving you everything you expect from the series. Of course you're going to be navigating the Vic Viper through some pulsating fleshy membrane at some point, right? <laughs> K 
Castlevania The Adventure Rebirth brings you back to the classic Castlevania gameplay, before Metroid is grafted onto it. It takes a lot from the first Game Boy game, such as a whip that shoots fireballs, but that was kind of assumed based on the title alone. This is the last original style Castlevania game that has been made to date, and it would be a shame to let it pass by. One of the most interesting things about WiiWare is that with well over 300 games released in North America, almost none of the most interesting titles were by Nintendo. Case in point, the unquestionable star of the WiiWare launch in May 2008 was a third-party title by Frontier Developments called Lost Winds. As the first original title that I'd ever downloaded for a console service, Lost Winds set the bar really high for what I expected of small download games going forward. With a gorgeous style and peaceful atmosphere, Lost Winds is a puzzle platformer where you direct the power of wind with the Wii Remote and guide a boy named Toku. While Lost Winds was ported to iOS where it was later delisted and is still available for PC, it was originally developed specifically with the Wii Remote in mind, so it's worth considering playing Lost Winds on its native hardware. Lost Winds 2, Winter of the Melodious, was released over a year later and expands on the gameplay with the addition of a season-changing mechanic. I highly recommend both games to any fan of puzzle platformers. No discussion on WiiWare could be complete without Mega Man 9. Sure, it was released for other platforms in the days following its Wii release, but I'll always think of it as a WiiWare game. At the time, it seemed like such a novel and unexpected approach, making a game that looked, sounded, and played just like it was another NES sequel. While it does take some liberties with the hardware capabilities, it's just about as close as anything modern has come to mimicking the NES style. And the crazy thing is that this is probably, honest to goodness, the best Mega Man game. Really, it feels like a true addition to the NES canon. The level and boss design is just excellent, making for a more balanced game than the series' crueler moments, while still providing more challenge than Mega Man 5 or 6. Mega Man 10 is a fine enough Mega Man in its own right, but for whatever reason, I never felt as compelled to replay it as I did Mega Man 9. Still, I'd like to shake the hand of whoever was bold enough to bring us Sheep Man. The only problem with both WiiWare Mega Man games is that a huge opportunity was missed here to run them in 240p. In fact, they don't even run in 480p, only 480i, which is kind of a mess. The PS3 and 360 versions are quite blurry themselves, but only on Wii can you use the NES Classic controller, which does feel so right. But overall, the best option for these games right now may be the Mega Man Legacy Collection 2, which has some scaling issues of its own, but at least there's a physical version of these landmark Capcom releases. And lastly, I have to give a nod to a personal favorite, Fast Draw Showdown. Now get ready for some real Fast Draw excitement. be more familiar with Mad Dog McCree, also by American Laser Games, but for my money, Fast Draw Showdown simply has more personality, is more fun for a quick pick up and play, and is great for quotable laughs with friends. So your mama lets you come out and play today. <laughs> oh. 
Gameplay amounts to nothing more than waiting to draw your gun until your opponent makes a move, not unlike Punch-Out tells if Punch-Out opponents went down with only one or two hits. Of course, you have to have decent aim too. Here's your chance to prove you're one of the best. It's a stupidly simple but tough game, and if you're a fan of the FMV aesthetic, then you really shouldn't miss it. A version was also released digitally on PS3 with the Move controller in mind, which features better quality video and extended cuts of various scenes. But unless you keep a PlayStation Move regularly charged and the PlayStation I hooked up, the WiiWare version may be more convenient. One body to go. Nice shooting. Real nice shooting. Hi, I'm Grace from Stop Skeletons from Fighting. While the Wii's insane popularity allowed for the porting of many obscure retro titles, giving them a larger audience, I think the focus of our little shop of Wii Shop Horrors needs to be on WiiWare, and especially the indie titles that will struggle to be officially supported in the future without the backing of major publishers. My favorites of these is 2009's You, Me, and the Cubes, the last console game by the late developer Kenji Eno of D and D2 fame. This quirky title is poetic, dark, cute, and also maybe has a penis joke in it. What else could you want from a WiiWare title? The gameplay itself was tailored for the Wii Motion Controller, which I think makes it even more important to snatch off the Wii Shop while you still can. It's a physics-based puzzle game where you must toss your Phallos characters onto the cube in order to balance it. Your actions are judged by the all-powerful Cubie, who functions as your guide and the ultimate arbiter of all things cube. It's... it's... all life or death, with your successfully placed Phallos characters ascending to the next plane of existence, while your fallen Phallos and their blood-curdling screams are doomed to hurtle through the Black Abyss forever. And hey, it also has a two-player mode. Overall, this game feels like a tristice on the wonders and pitfalls of teamwork. I highly recommend it to lovers of slightly frustrating puzzle games and obscure titles alike. Good. Congratulations. Well, what's the damage looking like? Grabbing everything worth playing on the Wii Shop channel is certainly a pricey proposition. The Virtual Console and WiiWare services, despite criticisms over slow releases at times, were actually far more prolific and worthwhile than some people might have realized. For many Nintendo fans, the Wii Shop channel showed the potential of what Nintendo could do with digital distribution, but now we see just how fragile it can be. In the coming weeks, no more money can be added to your account. And eventually, no more purchases or re-downloads. What happens if in 2020 your Wii console dies? All of that money spent on digital games, poof. At a time when you can no longer buy these games, it's hard to deny the viability of other options, whether via homebrew on your own Wii or Wii U or the Dolphin emulator. Regardless of how you choose to play these games in the future, we hope you've enjoyed this celebration of the Wii Shop Channel's legacy. Even if it won't be around forever, may its games not be forgotten. Yeah.